Committee on Space will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled Commercial Remote Sensing, Facilitating Innovation and Leadership. For over two decades, the United States has led the world in space-based commercial imagery, supporting our civil, commercial, and national security communities. In just the past few years, American innovation in space-based remote sensing has enjoyed a period of immense growth. American companies are investing in and developing a host of new and innovative technologies, services, applications, including space-based full motion video, hyper and multispectral imaging, space-to-space -space remote sensing and commercial signals intelligence. As these technologies grow, we must ask, why, what, and how should we regulate space-based remote sensing activities? The last time Congress passed legislation on this subject was the 1992 Land Remote Sensing Act. Back then, CubeSats had not yet been invented or standardized. Computers, sensors, and other key technologies were orders of magnitudes, more expensive and far less capable. Today, we depend on these technologies and the geospatial data that they produce. Satellites, UAVs, and many other data collection systems provide the public with unprecedented information. After 24 years, it's time to take a hard look at these changes and see where the laws, regulations, and policies governing this industry need reform. Section 202 of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act directed the Secretary of Commerce in, cons in consultation with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote, Remote Sensing, also known as ACRIS, to report on statutory updates necessary to license private remote sensing space stations no later than November the 25th of this year. For this report to be worthwhile, the Secretary should ensure the Advisory Committee has sufficient time to contribute to and inform the, uh, and inform the report. Let me say again that Congress directed consultation with ACRIS. Yet, as we near the due date for the report, I have some concerns. The last time the Department of Commerce held an ACRIS meeting was in June 2015, over a year ago. This is unacceptable in light of the law passed by Congress and signed by the President directing the Department of Commerce to seek guidance from ACRIS. Slow rolling and obstructing this law is not only an affront to Congress and the President, <clears throat> but also to the American people. The Department has had ample time to draft the report, call an ACRIS meeting, and solicit their input. In addition, since the passage of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, the Department has changed the composition of ACRIS by including representatives from federal agencies. And while the inclusion of federal representatives on ACRIS is within the authority of the Secretary, it is completely unnecessary. The Department already has a multitude of ways to engage with other federal agencies. <clears throat> In a response to the recent oversight letter, the Department argues that including federal representatives in ACRIS' membership facilitates meaningful interaction among government experts, knowledgeable industry representatives, and other critical stakeholders to provide advice to the Department. While this may be true, it's also true that such interaction does not necessarily require inclusion of federal representatives on the advisory committee. One thing is certain. If ACRIS operates on a consensus basis, the inclusion of federal representatives gives the executive branch a means to influence and control of the advice provided, including advice directed by Section 202 of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. We as Congress and as a nation must adhere to certain principles as we reform that which governs private space-based remote sensing. First, we must ensure U.S. industrial leadership, and this requires regulatory certainty in a permissive environment that promotes innovation. In addition, we must, to the greatest extent possible, <clears throat> 
have both friend and foe justifiably rely on U.S. private sector services and applications. Finally, we must address broader national interests, particularly our national security interests. Few cont would contest these principles. The challenge lies in achieving the right balance. And right now, the balance is all out of whack. This is partially a result of the policy Congress established in the 1992 Land Remote Sensing Act and partially due to executive branch policies and regulatory processes. <clears throat> Congress and the administration can and must work together on reforms that encourage U.S. industrial innovation in a way that aligns with national security interests. We cannot have the private sector compete with national security. Make no mistake, we need reform. Over the past several years, NOAA's commercial, uh, commercial remote sensing license applications have increased exponentially. Many of these applications are precedent setting and challenge the legal construct of the 1992 Land Remote Sensing Act. Some of NOAA's licensing actions are months, if not years, over the 120-day determination uh, timeline, which is required by law. Companies are applying and waiting without understanding as to why NOAA takes so long to get back to them. Uh, stakeholders report significant uncertainty with licensing actions, including modifications to operational license conditions without notice or due process. American remote sensing startups want to stay in the United States, but must plan for overseas operations due to uncertainty in the regulatory approval process. Without reform, we risk losing American leadership in commercial remote sensing. Such a loss hurts our national security and our economic competitiveness. We saw this happen before when in the 1990s, a number of U.S. companies sought to establish commercial space-based synthetic aperture radar, or SAR, remote sensing satellite services. But due to regulatory uncertainty and dysfunction in the executive branch license determination processes, U.S. investment went overseas, unfortunately. Instead, Germany and Canada benefited. Each established for-profit commercial synthetic aperture radar remote sensing satellite services, which to this day dominate the international commercial market. We can't make the same mistake again. I am dedicated to continuing vigorous oversight on this subject and working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to achieve constructive reform. I want to thank today's witnesses for joining us as we discuss these very important issues, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. And uh, I now recognize the ranking member, the gentlewoman from Maryland, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today on commercial remote sensing, facilitating innovation and leadership. And I'd like to welcome our distinguished panel of witnesses today. Since the 1980s, Congress across Democratic and Republican presidents and Congresses has set policy to encourage the development of commercial remote sensing industry as well as the government's purchase of commercial remote sensing data as appropriate. The Land Remote Sensing Policy Act of 1992, as the chairman mentioned, established the framework for licensing and regulation of commercial remote sensing satellites under the Department of Commerce. Establishing a licensing regime was needed to fulfill our obligations under the Outer Space Treaty for supervision of non-governmental activities in space and for providing U.S. private entities with a legal mechanism for carrying out commercial space uh, commercial space-based remote sensing operations. Subsequently, since 1996, the Department of Commerce has issued about 100 licenses for commercial remote sensing systems. Over the past few years, the explosion of CubeSats and advances in sensing capabilities have led companies to propose novel uh, approaches to collecting space-based remote sensing data. Indeed, commercial remote sensing is now a dynamic and growing industry. In addition, the societal benefits these data provide for such global issues as natural disasters are evident with the appearance of commercial remote sensing images in televised news and headline newspaper articles. 
These exciting developments, however, mean that the days of relatively straightforward license applications are indeed over. As part of the licensing process, novel architectures, orbital mechanics, and new sensing capabilities must undergo careful consideration across the government to assess any impacts to national security and foreign policy and to ensure the safety of existing orbital operations. Several stakeholders, including NOAA's Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing, have indicated that delays in approving licenses and operational constraints imposed by the licensing process may be impeding the current growth and evolution of the industry. And in fact, Title II of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act was enacted last fall, just last fall, um, last year, requires a report on potential statutory updates that might be needed for licensing commercial space-based remote sensing systems. That report is due in the coming months. In fact, a year from enactment, um, the report is due in November. I certainly hope, Mr. Chairman, that the subcommittee will have an opportunity to examine that report with NOAA before considering any potential updates to law, policy, or regulations. And indeed, it would have been helpful to have invited NOAA uh, to appear here today. They are not the enemy. They're our partners in trying to figure this out for the future. But before closing, Mr. Chairman, I want to highlight the enabling role that federal research and development continues to have in enabling the success of this industry. It is federal investments in remote sensing research and development, the free and open dissemination of federally provided remote sensing imagery, and the federal government purchase of commercial remote sensing data that makes this vibrant industry and its supporting value-added enterprises possible. And I hope that we can have a partnership as we move forward, both with the industry and with our federal uh, executive partners to make sure that we're setting policy in the right <coughs> direction. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, I now recognize the chairman of our full committee, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the commercial remote sensing space sector continues to experience unprecedented innovation and growth. Investments are being made in new technologies and applications with the potential to significantly improve the world we live in. According to the Satellite Industry Association, in 2015, Earth Observation Services revenues grew by 10 percent over the previous year. This growth is attributed to the development of smaller satellites, lower manufacturing cost, lower launch cost, and a growing uh, customer base for remote <coughs> sensing data. In other words, innovation. The Institute for Defense Analysis Science and Technology Policy Institute reached similar findings in its 2015 report, Global Trends in Space. The report stated that, quote, expectations are especially high in the space remote sensing and space Earth observation sectors where high resolution, frequently updated geospatial imagery can provide information on the location and movement of people and objects, end quote. Fortunately, the United States leads the world in these promising entrepreneurial endeavors. U.S. satellite remote sensing companies continue to push ahead and make the headlines. But the laws, regulations, and policies that govern private remote sensing space systems have not been updated for decades, are outdated, and cumbersome. It's time for Congress to take a hard look at how we can streamline and reduce regulatory burdens. The private sector's innovation and leadership continue to outpace the government's ability to keep up with the industry with very serious consequences. In fact, the United States may lose its innovators, its investors, and its leadership due to outdated and improper regulation and policy. Last year, the Federal Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing stated that the U.S. government needed to fundamentally rethink its approach to commercial remote sensing and policy. The committee found that traditional conceptions of remote sensing as an aerospace technology are outdated. It stated, quote, agencies continue to think about remote sensing as a traditional aerospace technology when, in fact, it is increasingly an information technology requiring a different regulatory philosophy and regulatory actions. U.S. government stakeholders must tailor policy and regulations to reflect the fact that remote sensing is no longer a U.S.-only, exclusively satellite-based effort but is instead a global information technology that relies on a wide range of platforms." End quote. One of the complex challenges with reform stems from the fact that there are not only legal or regulatory challenges, but also process and oversight challenges. 
For oversight, Congress needs certain types of information in order to ensure that the administration follows the law. Unfortunately, the Secretary of Commerce and the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration have not been timely in producing such information. The Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, signed into law last November, directs the Secretary to report every year basic information about how many license applications were received, how they were adjudicated, and how long it took. This information would let Congress know whether or not NOAA is satisfying their statutory responsibilities under existing law. But even this basic information hasn't yet been provided to Congress. The United States can continue to lead the world in commercial remote sensing, but we must ensure the law, regulations, policies, and processes governing this industry are well suited for the realities of our time. I do thank our witnesses for being with us today and look forward to hearing their testimony. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate you holding this hearing and thank the panel of witnesses uh, that are here today. Uh, enabled by years of federal investment, the commercial remote sensing industry has made significant progress. In addition to selling um, high resolution imagery to government and commercial customers, a number of companies are proposing new approaches to remote sensing, including using constellations of smaller satellites to provide imagery more frequently. As many of the members of this subcommittee know, the licensing operations of private space-based remote sensing systems fall within the jurisdiction of the Department of Commerce, namely NOAA's Assistant Administrator for Satellite and Information Services Commercial Remote Sensing, Sensing Regulatory Affairs Unit. Industry growth has impacted the licensing workload of that unit. For example, while 26 licenses were issued from fiscal year 1996, the fiscal year 210, 75 licenses were issued from fiscal year 210 to fiscal year 2015. And just within fiscal year 2015, 33 applications for license were filed with the unit. With this backdrop, I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses on ways in which NOAA's regulatory function can be improved in the face of evolving technology and projected operational advancements. In particular, I'd like to know whether there is a need to update NOAA's licensing regulations and whether NOAA operations can be streamlined. For example, in dealing with the increasing number of CubeSats requesting a license. I would also be interested in hearing whether new regulations can be developed without unduly limiting the promise of innovative commercial remote sensing technologies while at the same time addressing any legitimate concerns of the intelligence and national security communities. Chairman Babbitt, today's hearing is important and I appreciate you having it. In addition to today's testimony, I would urge you to invite NOAA representatives to a future hearing to lay out the challenges they face and actions they plan to take to address them. I thank you and yield back. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, I would add that uh, before we deliver the report, there are, uh, we will invite them after the report is delivered. Okay. Now I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Uh, our first witness today is uh, Mr. Kevin O'Connell, President and CEO of Innovative Analytics and Training. Uh, Mr. O'Connell is a leading analyst, scholar, and writer on national security and intelligence issues. For over three decades, he has been deeply involved in identifying, analyzing, and helping manage emerging threats to the nation's interests, whether governmental or commercial. His prior U.S. government experience has included assignments with the Department of Defense, the Department of State, the National Security Council, Office of the Vice President, and the Office of the Director of Central Intelligence. He serves today as a senior consultant to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. He was a long-standing member and later chairman of NOAA's Federal Advisory Committee 
on commercial remote sensing, or I mis mispronounced it a while ago, acres, between 2002 and mid-2016. He received his BA, his Bachelor of Arts in International Studies from the Ohio State University, and his Master's in Public Policy from the University of Maryland. We will recognize you for five minutes, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Babin, Ranking Member Edwards, uh, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to testify today on how we can sustain U.S. leadership and innovation in commercial remote sensing. Uh, today I'll be speaking from my own personal vantage point, having looked through all of the assignments that the Chairman has mentioned over the years at the issue uh, of commercial remote sensing. And I'm proud to have served on NOAA's Federal Advisory Committee since inception in 2002 until recently both as a member and then in more recent years as the chairman. Remote sensing technologies, processing and analysis, as has been already said, are changing dynamically. American companies like Black Sky Global, Digital Globe, Harris Systems, Omni Earth, Planet, Terabella, and others are at the cutting edge of the global commercial remote sensing market. They feature a remarkable diversity of technical approach, business models, and operational concepts, world-class technology that's supported by fast-breaking parallel developments in areas like cloud computing, advanced analytics, and others, and they're able to leverage new funding sources in the private sector and venture capital markets and the ability to leverage a broad geospatial ecosystem that is global. In my written testimony, I, t I identified six big trends that I think influence the global market. I'll only mention them here, and we can talk about them later. One, a growing demand for new applications, both in the government and in the commercial sector. The rise of analysis. Increased access by a wider range of participants. Increased globalization. Changing business models, and last but not least, the growing importance of non-technical factors, such as national prestige and workforce development. U.S. policy has been consistently forward-looking and bipartisan over the past 20 years but our future rests atop a more uncertain foundation created by traditional bureaucratic mindsets, an outdated regulatory system, and deep concerns concerning the trade-offs between innovation and national security. The U.S. government needs to benefit from leveraging by solely creating the kinds of capabilities, information, and analysis that are increasingly available in the market. The U.S. government, including Commerce and NOAA, play five roles in the, in the market customer, patron, a regulator, a competitor, and an advocate. And by the way, these are not purely theoretical roles. They are active policy roles, every one of the five. They sometimes conflict with one another. But the speed of technology and innovation is rapidly changing and outpacing the ability to keep up with policy and regulatory developments. As is the case with many other information technologies, the U.S. government must reformulate its approach and practice if it wants to remain on the cutting edge of these technologies. Let's talk for a moment about the regulatory regime. The regulatory regime needs to be modernized both substantively and from a process perspective to objectively reflect the current market and technology trends. Speed is an important market and even national security discriminator. Other than the consolidation of existing statutory authority in 2010, there have not been much modifications, as has been said, to the Commerce Department's authorities in this area for over a decade during which time novel technologies, operational concepts, and business models have emerged. Current regulations, for example, don't extend beyond the electro-optical realm. They're out of date in terms of control and leverage mechanisms, and they don't reflect modern ideas about how to shape global markets and thereby enhance U.S. national security. I understand that proposed uh, uh, NOAA resources in the President's budget for FY17 uh, are welcome. Uh, but that does not necessarily guarantee that the regulatory regime will be modernized in such a way that is both limited and efficient. Policy and regulation should be anticipating future opportunities and challenges, not looking backwards, as is sometimes the case. Let's talk for a minute about security issues. Remote sensing has a very rich history in the security of our nation. That security history sometimes clouds our thinking about how advanced security and leadership through successful commercial remote sensing. Four key points. We need to attract top talent and investment to the United States. Under a functioning regulatory structure, the U.S. maintains leverage and shapes global developments. Failure to adapt our mindset 
will push innovation offshore. Secondly, we need to reframe our thinking about imagery within the National Security Toolkit, especially as it helps with shaping the national security environment in areas like humanitarian relief and others. Okay. Uh, I would note, uh, for example, some of the work being done at NGA by Mr. Cardillo in thinking in a different way about how to apply imagery and information sharing. Third, given concerns about space security, the U.S. benefits from the resilience created by a robust commercial market. Diffuse global reliance on commercial satellite systems redefines the strategic environment for space. And fourth, very important, something I've written about for almost 20 years, we need to learn how to live in a much more transparent world. We need to update our thinking about how to protect U.S. troops, U.S. facilities, U.S. public at large for this world, but not fixate on information control. Obviously, the United States government will retain the option for dire national emergencies, but we need to think about security differently. I'll close in saying that the nation still holds a leadership position and a strategic advantage in commercial remote sensing, and we have a bipartisan policy to encourage it. U.S. policy and regulatory mechanisms need to be updated for the current technology and market factors and must anticipate newer developments with an eye toward efficient and practical rec regulation and incentive creation for U.S. industry. The nation as a whole benefits from this. Inaction and indecision will result in strategic failure, and being defensive only seeds advantage to foreign competitors. Given longstanding U.S. policy aims and an American innovation culture, in my view, the only long-term strategy is offense. And on that note, I'll look forward to the other testimony and certainly your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Appreciate that. And our second witness today is uh, Mr. Kevin Pomvret. Uh, he is the founder and executive director for the Center for Spatial Law and Policy. He is also a partner at the at Williams Mullen Law Firm and co-chair of both the firm's Unmanned Systems and the Cybersecurity and Data Protection Practice Groups. His career began as a satellite imagery analyst where he helped to develop imagery collection strategies to mon monitor arms control treaties and identify requirements for future collection systems. In addition, he is a member of the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. He earned his JD from the Washington and Lee University School of Law and his BA from Bates College. So I will recognize you for five minutes, Mr. Pomfret. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon to you and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Center for Spatial Law and Policy in connection with the hearing on commercial remote sensing. Geospatial information can be generally defined as information about a person, place, or thing that can be tied to a particular place on Earth. It can be collected in a variety of ways using a number of different technologies. For example, geoinformation can be collected from sensors mounted on satellites, manned aircraft, drones, automobiles, ships, and mobile devices such as smartphones. Alternatively, it can be collected from fixed ground-based sensors or by individuals walking around a neighborhood with a notebook collecting information for a census. Geoinformation includes the location, size, and shape of a lake, the median income of a particular zip code, a street address, hours of operation of the closest Starbucks, or the coordinates of a suspected terrorist. There are a number of legal and policy issues associated with the collection, analysis, storage, and distribution of remote sensing data and other types of geoinformation. These issues include intellectual property rights, privacy, licensing, liability, and national security. These issues are global and cut across a number of technology platforms, including commercial remote sensing satellites. The commercial remote sensing industry is an integral part of a global ecosystem of businesses, government agencies, NGOs, research organizations, and citizens that collect, analyze, and distribute geoinformation. Each stakeholder in this ecosystem can serve as both a data collector and a data user, often simultaneously. This ecosystem creates products and services that allow an analysis and visualization of information from business and government databases overlaid on an image or a map created from imagery and aggregated with geoinformation collected and shared by individuals through tools such as OpenStreetMap. Geoinformation is a versatile and powerful asset that is being used in a growing number of important business, governmental, and environmental applications that have tremendous economic and societal value. 
For example, a satellite image can be used by a business in deciding where to open a new store, by a consumer using his or her satellite navigation device to find the store once it is opened, by the city's Department of Transportation to decide where to put lights in order to address the traffic issues associated with the store's opening. Unfortunately, like other technologies, it can also be used by a criminal in planning to rob that store. This power of in information to assist in decision making is based upon a number of factors, including data type, timeliness, accuracy, precision, and completeness. In general, decision making improves with a greater avail availability of higher quality geo information. This versatility and power enhances the value of geo information. However, it can also be a significant challenge from a policy and regulatory standpoint. For example, efforts by law enforcement to control the collection and use of imagery to reduce store robberies will also limit the ability of businesses, governments, and, cons and consumers to use the same information in ways that save time, money, and lives. Historically, historically, the United States has been a global leader in most geospatial technology. However, today the geoinformation marketplace is truly global. For example, Singapore is on the cutting edge of using geoinformation for transportation in smart cities. In 2011, the United Nations formed the UN Global Geospatial Information Management Initiative to assist in the global development of geospatial information and to promote its use to address challenges such as disaster response, food security, migration, and the Sustainable Development Goals. The geo-information marketplace is extremely competitive. Technology advancements have contributed to a dramatic increase in the number of platforms that collect geo-information, including, as discussed today, small sats, drones, and mobile devices, as well as improved software tools to analyze and visualize this information. Despite these changes in the market, consumers of geo-information still are more interested in whether the product or service will help them in their decision making rather than the platform or sensor in which the geo-information is collected. As a result, overly restrictive regulations on one technology or one platform will make that, le that sector less competitive. Technology, inherently, technology policy inherently involves balancing perceived risks with potential benefits. Concerns associated with commercial remote sensing satellites need to be weighed against the growing role that geo-information is playing in our daily lives. Policy should also consider the opportunity costs associated with not collecting the information and realizing the full value, or reason, realizing its full value. Laws and regulations that pertain to geo-information should be narrowly tailored and transparent, and such laws and regulations should be continuously reviewed and updated to reflect this changing technology landscape. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pomfret. We appreciate that. And our third witness today is Ms. Michelle Westlander Quaid. Uh, pri who is founder and president of, of Sunesis, or Sunesis, is that right? Uh, Nexus LLC. Prior to founding her own company, she served as Google's chief technology officer for the public sector and chief innovation evangelist. Before joining Google in 2011, Michelle served in both industry and government. Her government service includes Deputy Technical Executive for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Intelligence Community Deputy Chief Information Officer for the Director of National Intelligence, and Chief Technology Officer for the National Reconnaissance Office. She is also uh, an ACRES member. She earned a Bachelor of Science from Seattle Pacific University, a, master, a master's degree in optics from the University of Rochester, and she is a graduate of Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government program for senior managers in government. Uh, so we uh, will give you five minutes, uh, Ms. Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to be here to speak with you today on this important topic of commercial remote sensing and keeping America's leadership position in this area. I refer to my written testimony for further details on my experience, but I want to highlight some specifics here. In my last assignment in government, I served on, as the DNI Director of National Intelligence Representative to the Secretary of Defense Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Task Force. And we were focused on stability operations in Afghanistan and around the globe. And something that really was driven home by that experience is the importance of information sharing, not only with the Commonwealth, not only with the coalition, but with non-traditional partners. And those can include local citizens, private volunteers, and humanitarian organizations. Those people don't have clearances, and they need access to information in a geospatial context. And so 
this geospatial information we're talking about from commercial satellites are critical to those type of operations. And so as was mentioned, after my government service, I joined one of the most innovative companies in the world, Google. And one of the things I want to highlight on that environment is defaulting to trust and empowering people to innovate and make decisions and affect positive change. Also highlight something, a, a default to share model while also employing a security team that is second to none. And in that environment, how innovation could flourish and the national security community would do well to benefit, they would benefit from that type of model. This, these experiences that I've had throughout my career have really shaped my perspective. And again, more details are highlighted in my written testimony and more uh, details on several national security issues. But I want to highlight some themes. The only constant is change. Heraclitus said that in 500 BC, and it's even more important today. The speed of change in the remote sensing industry is unprecedented. The US government must strive to make itself the veritable Delaware for commercial remote sensing, attracting the top talent and creating an environment in which they can innovate and flourish and thereby enable US to maintain a leadership role. If we don't share together, we risk dying together. Commercial imagery being open can be freely shared. National technical means imagery, being from a classified source and therefore classified, cannot be easily shared. It's rare these days that we are in a US-only operation. More often than not, we find ourselves working with partners we have not previously worked with before. And embark on an endeavor with these partners where shared situational awareness is not only key to the success of the mission, but also critical to the safety of all involved. For example, counterterrorism operations and humanitarian assistance and disaster response operations, or HATER, require the ability to share information with the coalition of the day, which often includes those non-traditional partners I mentioned before. By sharing this information in a geospatial context, we can enable what I call unity of effort without unity of command. Imagery from commercial remote sensing is critical to these operations whether in Afghanistan or Haiti or the United States. It's not just about pixels, it's about information services derived from the data. If you talk to most any of the big names in Silicon Valley, they aren't cared so much about the imagery and the pixels. They care about the information services they can derive from that data and constantly updating the services they provide, many of which are become very critical and we depend on in our lives today. In addition, geo-referenced social media and news sources can provide valuable insight and additional context to an HADR scenario as we saw following the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Once again, commercial imagery provides critical, shareable context. Utilizing commercial remote sensing assets and automated processing can be a huge competitive advantage. Commercial companies like Google uh, have cybersecurity expertise and can provide an ability to share data securely and the government could benefit by harnessing commercial data and the automated processing to provide secure access to data information and expertise around the world. We collect massive amounts of data every day, but just because we collected it doesn't mean we're any smarter because you can't do intelligence by osmosis. Someone has to look at the data and we don't have enough human resources to do it, so we need to get the machines to do it and tip the humans what to look at any given day and any given hour. If we don't take intelligent risk, we risk becoming irrelevant. In my experience, the biggest barriers to innovation are culture, policy, and technology, and most often culture is the biggest challenge. In the case of remote sensing, the government used to be the only game in town, and now others have entered the field. There is no way for the government to predict what could come next or to keep pace or to accurately judge the viability of commercial business model. Creating an overly burdensome regulatory environment and oversight policy that holds commercial innovation back until such time that the government can catch up or get comfortable with it is not reasonable or responsible use of authorities and can have a devastating consequences for the industrial base. The burden should not be put on industry to justify why. The burden should be put on the government to justify why not. What has made this country great is our industrial base and intelligent risk taking. There are completely new fields being invented, and we do not tend to see the same level of 
government regulation and oversight in those arenas as we have observed in the commercial remote sensing arena. Yet some of these capabilities have become just as critical to our national security and our way of life. Government should empower, not compete with industry. We're dealing with limited resources, so we must focus the resources government does have on things unique to its mission and uniquely governmental and leave the rest to industry. The potential loss of our industrial base is a national security issue. U.S. policy articulates a very supportive environment for commercial satellite industry, and artificially constraining what U.S. commercial industry can build or sell handicaps them in the international marketplace, which is quickly being flooded with others who do not face the same restrictions. And the overregulation, as is highlighted before, has led to the demise of commercial U.S. satellite ventures in the past. So leadership has set the vision in NSPD 27, PPD 4, and the 2011 National Security Space Policy. Now we must implement that vision. So in conclusion, we cannot lose sight of the characteristics that have made the U.S. a global leader, and that includes courage, intelligent risk-taking, and innovation. Our world is changing pace and be agile and adaptive. So our regulatory environment must enable them to do so and not thwart the very characteristics that have enabled the U.S. to enjoy a leadership position. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Quaid. We appreciate that <clears throat> very much. Uh, our fourth witness is Mr. Michael Dodge, Assistant Professor and Graduate Program Director in the Department of Space Studies at the University of North Dakota. At the University of North Dakota, he teaches courses that include space law, history of the space age, space politics and policy, and remote sensing law and regulation. He's also an editor of the Journal of Space Law. He received his JD from the University of Mississippi School of Law and his LLM in Air and Space Law at McGill Faculty of Law in Montreal, Canada. So we give you five minutes, Mr. Dodge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to participate in the hearing today, and it's a privilege to be invited, so I am happy to offer some thoughts on this timely topic. For the most part, extant commercial remote sensing law and regulation has served the United States and its commercial interests quite well. However, the current system is no longer ideal for either the federal government or industry, and changes to the nature of technology and business over the years since the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act of 1992 have generated new opportunities that can be successfully exploited with regulation that more fully conforms to the spirit of the national space policy, as well as NSPD 27, more commonly known as the U.S. Commercial Remote Sensing Policy. Indeed, the laws or regulations respecting space-based private remote sensing systems stand ready for change, because although generally effective in supporting the needs of both the federal government and the industry, they nevertheless often cause unintended negative consequences for industry participants. In particular, complaints have been lodged that the system in its current instantiation has caused unnecessary obstruction in the licensing of certain data and even substantial delays in action on applications for the sale of data that can exceed statutory and regulatory limits. If Congress chooses to act with respect to this issue, there are a few mechanisms that can be utilized to ameliorate the current situation. Congress can, for instance, change the policy behind the law in an effort to better align the system. It can also choose to change the regulatory structure by modifying the statute governing private remote sensing systems. And as has been called for by some in the industry, better enforcement of extant standards could help relieve some of the pressure facing private entities seeking licensure and governmental permission to sell data and imagery. Possible changes could be done either by replacing the 1992 Act with a modern incarnation that better reflects the needs and interests of all the interested parties, or it could be done with clarifying amendments. If replacing the law wholesale proves too far for current congressional interest, the current system can still be improved with surgical statutory modifications that lead to refined regulations, renovating where necessary, to assist with concerns such as more rapid response to license applications, as well as reforming and, when possible, speeding the process of interagency review of matters that require input from the departments of defense or state. Recent legislative efforts have reinforced the notion that the role of government should adapt to benefit the needs of the private remote sensing industry. As an example, Title III of the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act requires the Office of Space Commerce to foster the conditions for the economic advancement of the United States space commerce industry. Indeed, this provision helps to demonstrate the need for legal and regulatory clarity vis-a-vis -vis commercial remote sensing. Moreover, this provision 
lends credence to utilizing clearer, consistently applied regulatory work for commercial interests. This philosophy is supported by United States policy, including the national space policy as espoused by the executive branch and the US commercial remote sensing policy, which note that the success of the commercial remote sensing industry is not only desirable, but closely linked with increased national needs, including strengthening United States national security. It should be emphasized that in most instances, there need not be friction between promoting commercial success and protecting national security, and that the two can and often do complement one another. Finally, clarity, be it in regulatory reform or by modification of the 92 Act, helps the United States to fulfill its longstanding public international law obligations under certain key provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. In particular, Article 6 requires authorization and supervision of the state party to the treaty for all of its non-governmental entities acting in space. In the current system, licensing can serve as the requisite authorization. Knowing when to license and, in colloquial terms, changing the presumption of licensing new technologies and avail available data resolutions to yes, rather than we will see, will both promote the success of an industry struggling to keep up or in some cases catch up with international competitors, as well as provide a clear statement to the international community that the United States intends to continue following its Article VI obligations through a more consistent and transparent <clears throat> process. I thank the committee for allowing me to speak at this hearing, and I am happy to answer questions as needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodge. And our final witness today is Ms. Joanne Gabronowitz, a Professor Emerita at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Uh, Mrs. Gabronowitz is the Director Emerita of the National Center for Remote Sensing, Air, and Space Law at the University of Mississippi's Law Center and Editor-in-Chief Emerita of the Journal of Space Law. Mrs. Gabronowitz has taught space uh, law for 28 years and lectures at various universities, including the University of Vienna and the Beijing Institute of Technology. She received her BA from Hunter College and a JD from Yeshiva University Cardozo School of Law. I now recognize um, uh, Mrs. Gabronowitz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for this opportunity to be here today. The entire text of my testimony has been submitted for the record. I will address four points. The first, a key question to be considered is whether federal, federal grants, contracts, or subsidies will be used to facilitate new national remote sensing legislation. And if so, what is the policy the funds are intended to enable? In approximately one decade, as military and intelligence space imaging requirements changed, the commercial remote sensing satellite industry decreased from three companies to one. The remaining company continues to operate due to its continuing NGA contract. After years of exchanging funds, contracts, products, and services, there is not a sustained long-term U.S. commercial satellite space-based industry. A single entity exists because of military funding, not because of an independent market. The NGA has announced a new commercial strategy that plans to use emerging technologies. Therefore, the question going forward is, will the previous cycle be repeated but with newer technologies? That is, an infusion of military funds into a few companies whose overwhelming focus must be to meet mission needs, followed by industry reorganization, catalyzed by change in requirements, followed by a winnowing of companies that will be likely rendered technologically less relevant in the face of the next new technology. Going forward, it ought to be clear whether congressional intention is to facilitate a true commercial information industry with a vibrant market or a dedicated capability dependent on military funds. The possibility of repeating the cycle requires two co consideration of two concepts. First, what is the con what constitutes commercial, and second, what should be done by the public sector and what should be done by the private sector, and I refer you to my written testimony for a full discussion. The second point is the global commercial remote sensing legal la landscape. U.S. remote sensing law is the apparent standard for remote sensing law around the world. Changes in U.S. law will be closely observed by other remote sensing nations. It should be expected that in some cases, changes made in U.S. law will be adopted by other nations. 
In addition to the U.S., there are currently 22 nations that have remote sensing laws and policies. The proliferation of remote sensing legislation was in response to the commercialization of high-resolution data. Some laws are more restrictive than U.S. law. In Canada, government satellites require licenses. That would be analogous to NASA or the Defense Department having to get a license for their satellites. In Germany, a satellite operator can uh, be subject to criminal sanctions if it finds out that data distributed got in the hands of entities that were anathema to Germany's na national interest. The U.S. only has civil sanctions. Third, two important policies. The first one is the non-discriminatory access policy created by the United States and adopted twice by this Congress. The second time it was adopted by this Congress, the, city, uh, the committee said, quote, the committee refrained from making any changes in the policy. Specifically, the committee is reluctant to take any action which might revive the debate in the United Nations about the legitimacy of remote sensing without prior consent. It is in the U.S. national interest to ensure that the non-discriminatory access policy is continued. Another important policy is the National Satellite Land Remote Sensing Data Archive. The satellite the scientific value of data grows over time, and in the era of big data, it now also grows in economic value over time. It is crucial to both public and private interests that the United States has data archiving policies in place for the very long term. And the fourth and final point I will address is the onerous licensing process that currently exists. Current regulations embody a worldview that reflect the closing days of the Cold War more than the globalization era technology development. This is most clear in the method of dispute resolution in an interagency disagreement. The Secretary of Commerce, Commerce is required to personally consult with the secretaries of state or defense, and this function, quote, shall not be delegated below the acting secretary, end quote. This dispute resolution structure gives substance to an often voiced criticism of the licensing process, namely that the government is overly protective of remote sensing capabilities and technologies. The regulations were promulgated in 2000 and revised in 2006. The interagency process was not revised. It, is, it may not be necessary to change the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act. However, after full year, a full 16 years, Revisiting the interagency process is appropriate. Among the potential changes that ought to be considered are mechanisms to determine if and when an individual agency policy is bringing more influence to bear than a national policy. The failure to reach a decision is based on disparity of political power more than anything else and the establishment of an authoritative dispute resolution mechanism that can be accessed below the cabinet level. I thank the committee for giving me this opportunity, and thank you for your work in developing the law of space. Thank you, Ms. Gabronowitz. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'd like to thank the witnesses for their testimony, and the chair now recognizes himself uh, for five minutes. Mr. O'Connell, in the 1990s, a number of U.S. companies sought to sell synthetic aperture radar images. Prohibition and dysfunction in the executive branch license determination processes push these companies overseas. Today, a number of U.S. companies are developing new and innovative space-based remote sensing systems, such as space-to-space -space remote sensing. Are we in a similar situation uh, that we were in in the 1990s with the possibility that American innovation and investment will go overseas to foreign competitors because of these regulatory challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Uh, absolutely, we are in that same position. And, and as a, a side comment, I'd make this comment as well. When we look at the 20-year modern history of commercial remote sensing, it's highly illustrative in both a good and a bad way for other areas of space commercialization, space debris, asteroid mining, others, and so we should learn our lessons from this particular area. But we're absolutely in that same case again, and I, we used to talk about this mostly in theoretical terms. Could companies go overseas? The reality is that the globalization of this technology and the information that's coming from it now creates incentives for other countries to offer deals, uh, 
opportunities for people to move overseas. Uh, and so I, I would greatly worry about that. Uh, I do see that NOAA has recently licensed a, uh, a commercial radar capability, which is a bright note, but the commercial radar capability issue is a history to avoid. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very, mu uh, very much. And now, uh, Ms. Quaid, uh, I don't think anyone would disagree that protecting U.S. national security interests is paramount. Uh, however, from a policy perspective, it seems that there's a question of what these interests should be, particularly in light of increasing international competition and wide availability of commercial remote sensing and geospatial data. Current policy places the obligation to mitigate national security risks on licensees, not necessarily on the government. As a result, foreign commercial operators are catching up with, and in some cases, passing the United States. It doesn't make sense to have policies that hold American innovation back and yet assist foreign competitors. Isn't it better to stay in the lead and dictate terms from a position of strength? And how should we as a nation be evolving our understanding of national security interests within this domain to ensure that America remains the leader? Thank you for the question, and I wholeheartedly agree with the statements that you made. I absolutely think, as I highlighted in my testimony, that taking the shackles off commercial industry, allowing them innovate, allowing them to do their best is absolutely what we must do because we want to maintain a leadership position. If we continue to handicap them, we will lose our industrial base, which is a national security concern. Furthermore, if we have the U.S. in the lead, those are friendly parties. And should we need to, in a crisis, there are ways to do regulations such as delay of release of information, or just like we do with overseas military uh, sales, is restricting who we could sell to. So those are things that we can act as needed if there is a crisis without overly burdening the commercial uh, industry. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. O'Connell. In your testimony, uh, you identified that there is a need to reform the law, regulations, and processes governing commercial remote sensing. What are the policy outcomes reform should achieve? And what, if any specific recommendations, do you have to effectuate such outcomes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think, ironically, that the intent of the current policy, as has been mentioned at the table already this afternoon, uh, is exactly right. It's to advance American foreign policy and national security interests, and I would argue in addition scientific interests, uh, through the creation of a robust commercial remote sensing industry. Uh, and so that's the, the broad dimension. Not much has to change there, quite frankly, in terms of intent. What does that allow us to do? It allows us to make investments on the government side of scarce budgetary dollars and stretching the limits of science, safety, and security on the one hand, while taking advantage of a whole new area of a commercial market in remote sensing and the knowledge that it creates. You know, in the industry, there's been, been sort of a, a question over the years, what's the killer app in commercial remote sensing? Uh, and maybe for now, we just have to be comfortable with the idea that the killer app is much more detailed understanding of lots of different developments that are on our planet. Okay. And so in addition to that, the knowledge base, the encouragement of young children and others to get involved, <clears throat> be excited by this whole set of, uh, set of issues that's coming forward. Uh, I think that's a starting point of some of the outcomes that, that, that we should achieve. To your former question about the national security interests, I'd just add one other thing. Uh, we do recognize there are consequences to our national security from a robust commercial imagery market. Okay. We have to deliberately understand those and take an objective view of how to deal with them. Mr. Chairman, if I could add to that. Sure, go is ahead. It, is to say that having a robust commercial marketplace provides resiliency for our national security architecture. Well said, thank you, Ms. Quaid. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Uh, now I'll recognize Mrs. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, I want to, it feels like we're having this um, same discussion in the commercial space flight arena as well, sort of how to balance um, government and regulation and government participation with the interest of facilitating a robust uh, industry, and that is uh, true here. 
Um, it, it does occur to me, of course, that the 1992 Act that established the licensing framework uh, for commercial remote sensing was enacted before the evolution of the commercial remote sensing industry. And while the industry has grown over time, as has been noted um, by M Mrs. Grabinowitz, that it's still pretty heavily dependent on government contracts and grants and, and resources. So it is not truly a commercial um, sector as yet. Uh, over the last few years, the number of entrants and advances in the capabilities and operations has also been quite dramatic. And so I'm trying to understand, and I heard some of this in Mr. Dodge's testimony, uh, whether the proposal is that there needs to be a foundational statute that has to change, or whether it's, it's the implementation of the current law and regulations that need to be updated. And I wonder if starting with Ms. Grabinowitz, if we could um, begin with you. Thank you. Um, there's no doubt that the interagency process needs a lot of work. There's no doubt. And that can be done be through the MOU of 2000, which is appended to, to the regulations in the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. I would be very careful about uh, wholesale changing the 92 statute, because there are a lot of things in there that in addition to commercial remote sensing that might come in play under a political process. For example, there is a national archive, which is something we absolutely need, and that could be put back on the table. There is the balance between the public sector and the private sector regarding Landsat that has a tortured 25-year history being pulled back and forth between the public and the private sector. So I think there's no doubt that the licensing has to change, that there has to be uh, mechanisms put in place, but that can all be done through uh, revising and re renegotiating the MOU of 2000 without necessarily touching the statute. And you could also then touch the, all the underlying regulations as well. Yes, absolutely, because it's part of the CFR. I mean. If you go to the statute first, you'll have to figure out what's going to go into that, and then you're back to square one with the, the regulations. Whereas I agree with Mr. Dodge's statement about a surgical approach, and the surgery starts with the 2000 MOU. And so, Mr. Dodge, could you comment on the um, areas where we could have changes to regulation, or maybe there need to be amendments? Um, to the 92 Act, but um, could you elaborate on your testimony? Well, there are a number of areas that could uh, could use some change, but I guess off the top of my head, one of the areas could be the fact that there's a 120-day period of time that the, for, for the interagency process for, for reviewing whether or not there can be an approval of a license. Um, that is a, is a long time, and for, a, for an, a business, for example, that can be onerous to their needs and interests. So you could make a, as I said earlier, a surgical uh, modification to modify that, for example, going down from 120 days to maybe 90 days or 60 days or whatever would be sufficient to both serve the needs of the industry whilst maintaining uh, the interests of the government and those sorts of data. Yeah, Mr. O'Connell, I wonder if you could um, tell me, I mean, there has been a uh, reference to the 120-day um, period. Uh, how much of that is impacted by the relatively static budget that um, the regulators face in terms of them being able to move forward the process? Uh, uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I, I think it's very much affected by that, as well as the extensive set of stakeholders in the U.S. government that have equities in, in remote sensing. Uh, and so you see, I think NOAA sometimes struggles with shepherding all of those, those entities and their viewpoints as, as we think about uh, the licensing piece. I think one of the things that, that troubles me is there are, uh, I'll, I'll say it this way, there are too many people who can say no and too many people who can stop the clock without direct accountability in the regulatory process. Uh, and as already has been mentioned, sometimes those 120-day delays are really onerous on businesses that are trying to get off the ground. And so how do you make sure that there's a transparent process? And there's, again, there's way too many examples of companies saying that on day 119, they've gone through a faithful discussion with NOAA about what they intend to put in the license. The clock runs, and on day 119, they get a letter that says, oops, we're not ready to do this yet. 
We've got to think about it a little bit more. And beyond that, there is opacity in the process. And lots of people, as I said, can stop the clock, and lots of people can say no in the process. Thank you. So Thank I think you. that's partly a resource issue, as you suggested. But there also needs to be more transparency in the whole process. And Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can we let Ms. Grivenowitz finish her, her sure. comment? Thank you. Thank you. And the only other thing I wanted to state is that the clock can be stopped at the level of the cabinet and assistance, special assistance to the president. When you're up in that stratosphere, there's no control anymore by the, the rank and file and the, the licensees to have to reach cabinet level where the clock can be stopped for reasons you won't know is a serious problem. Thank you. And now I recognize a gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is directed first at uh, Mr. O'Connell. And so if you could give your response and then following that, Ms. Quaid, if you would add your insight and then should any of the other three uh, panelists uh, wish to add their insights thereafter, please uh, feel free to do so. National security is a major application for remote sensing capabilities. It constitutes an important market for the industry. At the same time, national security concerns may constrain the commercial market through means such as licensing requirements that limit image resolution. Considering the international development of increasingly advanced remote sensing capabilities, how effective are current United States requirements such as resolution limits, shutter control, and export control regimes at addressing national concern security concerns? And if we fail to achieve meaningful reform, how will United States national security interests be impacted? Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, on the one hand, we have a national policy that says we're going to lead in the international world, not follow, not harmonize, et cetera. And I, I like to make that point first. National security is enhanced by us taking maximum advantage of these capabilities consistent with what we're doing on the government side. Uh, and so some of the mechanisms that you've referred to, uh, we really have to be proactive in thinking about innovation that comes from them for the government's purposes in addition to what may go on in the commercial market. Uh, and so we have to be sensitive to the national security implications of allowing things at, say, better spatial resolution, uh, some of the other things that you're talking about. It's a complex regulatory landscape, uh, and some alignment has to be done to look across those to see what the effect is on the actual industry and its, its effect on national security then in, uh, in, in accordance with that. Ms. Quaid. I think that the resolution limits, the example we have with SAR where we had a license granted and they were not allowed to sell better than five meter, which is not very useful, and we had another license granted where they were not allowed to sell better than three meter, which is also not very useful and viable in a commercial marketplace. And so we are looking at a reality where the U.S. is not a leader in synthetic aperture radar right now as a result of that. And then if we look at something like shutter control, if you, if you step back, and a lot of times the people writing the policy don't realize the practical implications of this, but saying I'm gonna black out certain regions of the globe and, and having to implement that on the commercial side can be extremely burdensome and complex and very costly versus saying, as I suggested before, where they might say a delay in a release of imagery or uh, you know, sells not to certain areas, but we must recognize there are, there are other vendors that are not US that may sell that data to someone that we don't want to have that data. So I think there are definitely better ways to provide, have a collaborative nature to say, let industry lead, let them innovate. That is in our national security interests. Those assets provide resiliency, and then we have a cooperative partnership with them in the national security community, then when the need arises, we can invoke something that will help protect national security interests. And for those with intelligence backgrounds, there's always ways to potentially spend money and ask them to task someplace else on that pass so they are not looking at the area that you are concerned with. So there are ways to get around this. Thank you. For Thank you, Ms. Quaid. Does anyone else wish to add any insight? Could I have one, one follow-up, please? Yes, Mr. O'Connell. Uh, there's, there's an important 20-year history to recognize here on issues related to shutter control and national security. And it's that there has never been an example where government and industry have not cooperated, especially when the government is clear in both space and time 
on its, on its concerns about national security. Okay. And so that's a very positive history that we need to leverage going forward uh, as we think about this. And, and if I can add, that is one thing is we're all American citizens, whether in industry or government, and we all care very deeply about the national security. So I agree with what Kevin said. Absolutely, there's been cooperation when we needed it for the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for, for being here. Uh, Mr. Connolly, you wrote, uh, we, quote, we need to think, update our thinking about how to protect U.S. troops, facilities, and operations in this increasingly transparent world, not fixate on information control as a source of security. And Ms. Westlander Quaid, you said again and again that because the that expanding the sense and capabilities gives us a resiliency, gives us, makes us more secure. How much pushback do you get from the Department of Defense and from flag officers on this perspective? It seems to me easier to be uh, in the industry that is growing and, and doing so well to argue this than perhaps it is from, a, from someone who has the responsibility to protect troops and protect the nation. Thank you for the question. In my time downrange with those combatant commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan, the need to share was paramount. And you had them taking essentially their authorities and saying, we may be violating policy, but we'll ask forgiveness later because lives are on the line. And I think that's important that we have data from assets that is freely shareable that can provide it in a context where we're going to you know, go after a terrorist and they're doing an operation at night. And that intel picture is great in the intel cell, but then they can't take it with them when they're going on the mission. And often the resiliency that we talk about with commercial assets, maybe the intel asset has not been over most recently, but a commercial asset has been, and that is the timely intelligence they need as they're doing their mission planning. So that's what I've seen. When lives are on the line, they will take it from any source, and the most important thing is that they can share that, and they can share it with the Commonwealth, the coalition, and the coalition of the day. But in listening to, for the last hour, it seems to be that the great conflict here, uh, the source of all this burdensome regulation and the need for new philosophy is the conflict on national security. So, isn't it possible also to have the national security leaders um, sitting at the same table to argue this? Would they be willing to do that? Or are they going to resist this? There are those of us on Acres, for example, who have held TSSCI clearances for me for my entire career, and we would welcome that discussion to understand specific national security concerns that cause them to raise the national security flag. In my experience, I don't know what they could be. <coughs> Okay, good, because that does seem to be the existential crisis here driving all this. Mr. Pomfret, you, you lead the Center for Spatial Law and, and Policy. It, you know, our chairman, Mr. Smith, at the beginning talked about, quote, the outdated and improper regular, regular, regulatory regulations and policy and that we need a different regulatory philosophy. There's been lots and lots of general comment about how outdated the process is. How do we go about fixing this? What process do we create to get something that is actually forward-looking 21st century? I think the first step is to recognize, one, that, we, that the, the remote, sendis, it, remote sensing industry is a global one, and some of the national security threats that, that people were concerned about back in 1992 and in 2000 and 2004 uh, from U.S. commercial systems are now uh, not, not the U.S. commercial systems. There, there, are a lot, there are a number of other actors that have sensors that are collecting this information, not just from satellites. So any balancing, I talk about the inherent balancing between the perceived risks and the benefits. Any balancing needs to take that into effect. Uh, I also think that we need to start thinking about, and you'll know my comments, I talked a lot about geoinformation and not about just remote sensing because I think we tend to have on uh, blinders and to think about regulating a certain sector, whether it be the uh, commercial remote sensing sector, or whether it be drones, or whether it be uh, issues associated with mobile devices, and to start thinking about it more broadly in terms of all this information that's being collected and how it's going to be used, because that's what, that's what the consumers care about, and that's what industry cares about. And even if we talked about here before about doing sort of a, a um, just a, a surgical change to a particular uh, law or regulation, to me, is a short-term fix and doesn't address the long-term implications of where this technology is going 
in what, if you want to have a location-enabled society, what that's going to look like and where the com commercial remote sensing industry fits into that. Okay, thank you. Mr. O'Connell, is the NOAA's enforcement requirement on visiting all ground stations reasonable? <laughs> is this a place to start? This is certainly one place to start, Congressman, and uh, this is a topic that we did take up in the committee uh, probably about a year ago. Uh, it is an old-fashioned way of doing it. Uh, the need to visit every single ground station, I would, I would argue, uh, perhaps at the technical limits, that in, we're living in a world where I might be able to control a satellite with an iPad or a, some sort of a mobile device. And so it's probably impractical, certainly within the resources that NOAA has, to visit every single ground station at least once a year. Uh, and that's, that's certainly one place. Uh, on the committee in, in public session, we recommended a number of things for NOAA to consider in that regard. One of them was, for example, uh, deputizing another federal official overseas. Uh, give them a checklist, ask them to uh, go out and do the inspection themselves, someone closer to where the ground station would be. Uh, and uh, th that, was not, uh, that was not agreed to, as uh, best as I understand. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here and, and testifying today. Um, I wanted to ask you, Mr. O'Connell, earlier you said current regulations don't address capabilities outside the electro-optical space spectrum. Is that correct? That's correct. And I think just a few minutes ago you said that there was recently a license given for radar, space-based radar. That's correct. So how do you reconcile those two? Well, I think there was a large discussion that went on, a large and lengthy discussion about applying what they could out of the regulations and nonetheless going ahead and issuing the license. So they are regulating and they are licensing. Do they have statutory authority to do that? Uh, Is that something we should give? I think you should take a look at it. Okay, that's important. Um, when you think about uh, transparency, we've heard from a lot of folks, I've heard, our office has heard from a lot of folks, that at the end of the day, they don't get a yes or a no, but they don't get a why either. Right. And sometimes they get a no, but they don't get a why. If you have, an age, if you have a company that's cleared, and it, it, do we have an obligation or should we have an obligation to make sure they understand why? Because Ultimately, we have an interest in making sure this industry is successful so that they, we want them to go and get more capital investments. We want them to build more satellites. We want them to get more uh, geospatial intelligence resources for us. But then we're not giving them an explanation of why they're not getting the license, which prohibits them from doing all those great things we need them to do. Congressman, that's a, a great question. And uh, it, it, it calls for a better conversation between the government on its precise national security concerns and the industry. There's clearances involved, there's all the other artifacts associated with doing that. But we have to have a better way to convey those national security concerns clearly and crisply to companies that are in the market. Uh, one of my best examples of this is when I hear government colleagues say, uh, gee, do the business models close on these companies? You know, these companies are going to be profitable. It is proper for anyone in the government that expects to spend money with a commercial enterprise to have some sense of that. But as you might imagine, government officials are uniquely not positioned to make that kind of evaluation. One of the things that I've been, I've been pursuing is some surrogate that could come from an organization closer to the business model world, space insurance, space finance, uh, just as examples that we've thought about. But you're absolutely on the right track, which is we need a much better conversation, a clearer conversation. Can you do space insurance for a risk that nobody can possibly measure? <laughs> We're talking about political risk, I guess, in this case. Um, or, or business model risk. OK, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had a, another um, thought that, that, that I read recently, which is that the law requires that uh, the Secretary of Commerce consult with, but not concur with, necessarily, the Department of Defense or the Department of State. Is that correct? That's correct. So ultimately, the Secretary of Commerce, unless told a very explicit reason why not to do it, could just say, let's go forward with this, according to the law. That's correct. A anybody here disagree with that? So if we had maybe an aggressive Secretary of Commerce that was willing to push on that, could we get better results for the intelligence community and for the industry in general? I think that conversation would be improved, Congressman. 
I'm not saying we need a new Secretary oh, of no, Commerce. No. I'm just saying that m maybe that's one area the Secretary of Commerce could look at. Um, the one area, that, another area that I've heard and, and I have concerns on is this retroactive changing of licenses where people you know, get their license maybe not revoked but changed in a way that is not as um, beneficial to them in the future and they can't sell their products as much. Uh, what do we do to compensate them as a government? If they make investments based on a contract with the U.S. government, and that contract might be just a regulatory deal, not, that maybe, not a, maybe not a monetary deal, but a, a regulatory arrangement, and they go out and they start selling products, and then they have their license uh, maybe altered, and they can't close, close that business model, as you suggested earlier, what do we do to compensate when government makes that decision? And are we at risk of putting people out of business or m maybe not quantifiable, but are we at risk of having people not enter a business that they otherwise would have entered? Uh, absolutely, Congressman. I, I can't comment on what we'd pay them and how we'd make that calculation. And to my knowledge... Do we? In, uh, is, in, is there any... Is, does that ever happen? Anyone? It does happen? There are regulations about... Um, I mean, a license is an asset, and if it gets modified or changed, its economic value changes. And there are regulations. You need, you need to talk to a good contract officer here okay. about uh, for the needs of the government when something needs to be modified or ended that wasn't planned, how that's paid for. Okay. Uh, last question, Mr. Chairman, if you'll give me just a few more seconds here. Sure. Um, when you think about um, hyperspectral and, and um, synthetic aperture radar, we're, t we're always talking about space-based look-down capabilities. What about space-based look-up capabilities, maybe for better space-based space situational awareness? Uh, do, we, do we regulate that at all? Is there anybody trying to get a, a commercial license to do that kind of activity? Uh, and maybe anybody that you guys either represent or have represented that is involved in that activity? And would, would NOAA or the Department of Commerce be involved in issuing such a license? I've talked to a couple of people who say they're going to start companies in that arena. I do not believe that the regulatory process, or at least a, a reasonable one, exists to license that kind of capability. That's the point I was making before. I think we ought to look at this 20-year history as something to consider when we think about other areas of space commerce uh, that people, that companies are starting to enter, space uh, weather, SSA, space debris, uh, other things like that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Uh, Gebronowitz, um, I would like to thank you for your testimony explicitly because it said, it, it was, you were talking in there about the Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and that if they don't agree, Remember, this, this is after it's gotten through the staffers. It goes to them. If they don't agree, then it goes to the president. Well, the assistance to the president and then the president. And then the president. Mm -hmm. Do we know that that's ever happened? I personally have no knowledge. That's, have that seems like a bit much. I think the president has other things to do. If that's, if that's the process and that's, what it's written, if that's the process that's written down, uh, there's no runder it takes such a long time. So I, I thank you, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, I yield back what time I don't have anymore. Yeah, I gave you an answer. You took a mile there, Mr. Bradenstein. <laughs> no problem. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from uh, Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll start with where Mr. Bridenstine just left off. And I mean, two words obviously jump front and center, transparency and opacity. And... The other two words that come to mind are as pecking order. Because everybody at the table, all you panelists, probably have much higher clearances than anybody up here. And, you know, I, and obviously I've run into this. I've actually had a conversation with the Secretary of Commerce about a particular issue dealing with Digital Globe and something that's been hanging out there for two or three years now. And my sense is that whether there is some specificity in the law or not, there is a real or perceived pecking order 
in how decisions involving something that might be used by the intelligence community or might be used by the military or might be moved over to the civil side, how that all is developed. And so I want to start with you, Ms. Quaid, and then go to you, Ms. Gabranowitz, just to talk about reality here. Okay, theory is great. I'm a lawyer, okay, that's what I do. I, I try to deal with the law, but in these kinds of things, and Ms. Quaid, you talked about when life is on the line, when somebody's life is on the line, whatever these rules may be seem to go out of the window. If somebody at a cabinet level or some lower level or the special assistant to the president says, wait a second, you know, this could get a bunch of our soldiers hurt. You don't think that's going to stop NOAA from issuing a license? I mean, that's what I, I'm sensing here. So talk to us about reality. You've had a chance to be on the geospatial. Um, you're, you were with that department. So how does it work? How does it really work? Well, I'll tell you the biggest question, and it goes to this congressman's question as well, is when they got a no or they got the license revoked, were they given a why? And we have heard uh, time and time again, especially in Acres, about the national security concern, and as I mentioned before, to say, let's have the meeting, let's have the discussion, because we have to advise the Secretary of Commerce. And frankly, in the discussion we finally had, which I think was a whopping 30, 30 minutes, none of us who were in that session could agree that there was really a valid reason to say there was a national security concern and further thwart the requests that were coming forward. Were you, was, were you dealing with one of the intelligence agencies, or was this the, with NOAA? No, it was with quite a few of the intelligence agencies in the room in a, uh, in a skiff, as we'd say, where they have okay. secure discussions. And so what I think, as I mentioned in my testimony, the burden of proof being on the government to say why not and articulate that. And where there's those of us in the advisory roles who are kind of mediating between those in the national security community because we have the clearances and with the Secretary of Commerce that we can be informed and therefore we all want the best interests of America here. But when there is, we, we're fighting ghosts it's hard, you know, give me some tangible reason and then I can go explain to the Secretary of Commerce why she shouldn't do this, you know. Okay. And, and, and so without that data, you know, it's, it's hard to, to justify why we would say okay, no. Okay, let me go to Ms. Uh, Gabronowitz and then to you, Mr. Pum Pumfret. Okay. I have not had the kind of in the trenches uh, experience that uh, uh, Ms. Quaid has had, uh, but my observation has been that sometimes what happens is there's a, an agency policy that participants hang on to and, and promote, which may be different than a national policy, and it will stop there. Okay. Mr. Palmer. Uh, thank you. I guess the perspective I want to bring is that this isn't just unique to the United States, and it's not just unique to remote sensing satellites. Most geospatial technology has come out of the defense and intelligence communities over the years. And in many countries around the world, they have the first or, or last say, if you will, as to whether something can and can't be used for a commercial or civilian use. And they will play the national security card quite a bit. And I think it's natural given where they're sitting and their perspective and their background. So I don't necessarily fault them. But in countries around the world, in India, they're trying to deal with mapping legislation that would make it illegal for people who aren't government authorities to create maps. And there are similar situations in a lot of different countries around the world evolving geospatial technology and geospatial information. And so when we have this discussion, I think part of it is to recognize that yes, the technology started in these communities, but the environment has changed. And maybe some of the deference that was paid before isn't necessarily as, as critical as it, as it was. I'm not saying that no, that they shouldn't have any say, but the, 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 the balancing has changed. All right, last question if I could, Mr. Chairman. The last question would be, so to go back to placing the burden on the government or the, the intelligence community or the military to say, okay, in a skiff or in a secured environment, say 
here's why we don't want this to be available to the public. Is it, is it going to be written down and then published? Is it just available in a, in a confidential way? I mean, what are you, what are you thinking about here? Because there may be a middle ground for us so that the Secretary of NOAA actually can say, you know, this is why I'm not issuing this license. But right now, she can't. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and, and some of the discussion can be, can we go ahead and let them build it and launch it and operate it? And then when there is truly a national security concern, say a high-res collection over a certain area, that's when we say you can't disseminate it. 24 hours, 48 hours, ever, or you can't give it to these parties. And so we're not tying the hands of American innovation. What I worry about is going back to that SAR example, where they who said, no, you can't sell the one meter. And then boom, two international uh, competitors pop up while we've held them back. We could have been the leader there, and we don't want to repeat that. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You, Thank you. bet. Thank you. They've called votes, so we're going to uh, get our last question in here, and uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Davidson, I'll give you five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll keep it brief so I know we all have places we have to get to. So I'll just ask one general question that may take a little bit for you all to answer. What areas are we behind? And if I just think about this from the perspective of an entrepreneur, I got this great idea, uh, want to launch it. How do I know that, uh, well, you can't sell that. How do I, how do I, uh, how, do, how do I then, if I'm sitting behind the desk at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base looking for the greatest geospatial uh, uh, resources, how do I know that it even exists? Is there, you know, it's not like uh, all this stuff's going to wind up on eBay. Uh, so how do, does the, does our intelligence committee know that there's an entrepreneur working in a garage to come up with this, this radar? How does the guy that's working on this, uh, you know, latest, greatest, uh, you know, geo thing, uh, whatever the, the void in uh, technology is, how do, the, how do these people um, come to be aware that they're working on something that could be helpful to one another? Thank you, Congressman. I, I guess that's the place that the license and the licensing process should be the enabler, not the blocking mechanism. Uh, in essence, that's the basis for someone to understand in the government that a new kind of capability is being considered under commercial considerations. So that's the entry point where we know what people are thinking about. And at least in my time looking at this, there have been a lot of people coming forward with interesting capabilities. Not all of them will necessarily succeed for lots of different reasons, but that licensing process is the starting point at which somebody comes and says, I'm so serious about this, I'm going to create a business for it. And that should be the basis, that should be the, the enabler, ultimately, for doing that, uh, for creating that capability. Okay. So what are some examples where that didn't go correctly? So you look at it and say, hey, oops, now this is out there. We really wish that didn't. The downside of uh, a total security environment is you don't get all the innovation. Uh, uh, you know, an upside of an upside of it is you don't you don't uh, compromise stuff. It preserves the status quo, and since we're in the lead on a lot of things, we might like that. Um, it doesn't do good things for the market, but I guess that's the thing. How does there become this market? Uh, simply licensing, just the fact that uh, the people that know this space know. Gee, I, if I know enough to create this contraption, I, I know that I have to license it. Uh, how do they find that they've committed a, a, a violation of the law? Uh, surely they could; they wouldn't be prosecuted without an intent. Yeah. My my experience is, and, and I'm not sure if this directly answers your point, but that entrepreneurs uh, they operate very well in a well in a vacuum, and so. The uncertainty because of the business, the technology, the legal and regulatory uncertainty isn't a problem for them. They, they, will, they will fill that void. It gets to be a problem when you have a, a, a business that's, that's actually up, up and running and operating and you have products to sell and you hire lawyers and lawyers look at it and say, I have no idea what you can and can't do. And so we're, I'm, it's easier for me to say no and yes. So I think you see, and, and we've heard that there are a number of companies that have have applied for licenses because they just, their business risk is so great uh, 
that just filling out this regulatory paperwork is not, is not that big of a deal for them. But when you do start running a business and you're trying to figure out what you can sell to NGA and what you can sell to a foreign entity and what you can sell to someone else, that's where it gets really complicated. And that's where a lot of companies are hitting the wall because they, they see who their customers are or they think they know where they can get investments. But the challenge is that the uncertainty is such that they, that they, that they, they don't want to spend the money. They don't want to spend the 300 days waiting to get approval. Thank you. I yield back my time. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, this uh, that was my second warning. The votes have been called, but I would like to thank the witnesses for your very valuable testimony and the members for your questions. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments and written questions from the members. And so this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>